Anyway, nice to see you all uh, at what may be one of our last very big gatherings. Who knows? It's uh, troubled and unpredictable times. All kinds of things are happening and uh, more to come, both internationally and locally, I suspect. A State of the Union address, well, I can't promise the theatrics of the last effort of the US President, but I am interested and was interested in the preparation of these few thoughts to look back across what is now nearly eight years as the Archbishop of Brisbane. I, the last time I did this was after 100 days, which is only about three months, isn't it? That's way back in 2012, and I, when I think back to those days of my innocence and all that's happened in the meantime, it is astonishing, I suppose, astonishing that I survived to tell the tale, but it has been quite a ride in ways I ha of which I wouldn't have dreamt when I came in 2012. May 2012, it seems like ancient history. I can't remember life before Brisbane. But uh, so I asked myself this morning, well, what's happened in my life since those heady days of 2012 when I succeeded to the Sea of Brisbane following my old mate John Bathersby, who would ever have believed it in those early years when I first knew him and when we were students in Rome together it was unthinkable that Bats would have been the Archbishop of Brisbane, I think, and it was even less thinkable that I would succeed him. However, truth is stranger than fiction. Since 2012, I've certainly grown older and feel it. I was only in my early 60s. When I came here, I'm now in my early 70s, and any of you who have made that journey or are making it will know what I'm talking about. All kinds of things happen as you bid farewell to your 60s and say hello to your 70s. Physically, emotionally, spiritually, intellectually. So all of that's happened to me. I've also been elected the president of the Australian Catholic Bishops Conference at a time of no little turmoil. I state the obvious. This has also meant that I've been more intensely engaged nationally and internationally. I'm only back a week from meetings in Rome, which I attended as the president of the conference, with the vice president, Anthony Fisher, Archbishop of Sydney, and the president of the plenary council, Tim Costello of Perth. We decided that we would go to Rome and talk face to face with the, uh, the decision makers there, the curial heavies, uh, because in Italy they do business face to face. You can send all the letters you like and all the faxes, mountains of them. But uh, the Italians don't really do business like that. They do it face to face. And we had good meetings. We had hoped to meet the Pope. Unfortunately, we were told by his minders it was not possible. Non è possibile, purtroppo, eh? unfortunately. I said this to the Pope when I met him at the general audience. I just said, well, we're here and we had hoped to see you, but we were told that we couldn't. And he looked at me and said, ma come am I? How on earth did that happen? So I said, ask your minders. <laughs> so that's happened, the presidency of the Bishops' Conference at a very turbulent time. And then, of course, in more recent times, since I assumed the role that I now have, my predecessor has died, dear old Bats. And yesterday we welcomed his body back to the cathedral that was his for so long. And on Sunday night we will have the vigil and on Monday we will have the funeral. It's all rather grand and he wasn't like that. One of the things about John Bathersby was he kind of recast the Episcopal style. Frank Rush was the least pompous of men, in some ways a man of great simplicity of life. But Frank had a, a somewhat princely air about him. Marvellous man. But Bats lacked that whatever it is that Frank Rush had and he recast the role in very down-to-earth and very accessible ways. 
And I've been asking myself, because I was asked, what is John Bathersby's legacy to the Archdiocese of Brisbane? It's not an easy question to answer this. See, Bathersby was a man who, looked, who was straightforward but deceptive. He was very accessible, but there were great distances in John. So I ask myself, what's his legacy? Well, he wasn't a builder like Dewey. God knows they called him James the Builder. He put a church on every hill in Brisbane. Nor was he a builder of the Catholic community in the way that Quinn and Dunn were, where they brought so many people from Ireland to the point where they said, Queensland is becoming Queensland. So John wasn't that kind of builder, nor the kind of builder we see in James Dewey. nor was he the kind of memorable preacher that Frank Rush was. Frank was a beautiful preacher, quite apart from anything else. John wasn't that, and Frank was also the, the Archbishop of Brisbane who, who bedded down the Second Vatican Council in a powerful way here in Brisbane. It didn't happen everywhere. But that it happened here at all, and in fact it happened powerfully, was largely the work of Frank Rush. So John didn't do that kind of stuff. In some ways I think he, he struggled to escape the shadow of Frank Rush. Frank's was a very long and um, lovely shadow. And some would say that it was well, not until Frank Rush died that John really emerged in his own right as Archbishop. I wasn't around here at that time, so I'm not sure. But so what is John's legacy? God knows he was Archbishop for 20 years. That's a long time. Far longer, I hope, than my own tenure. And it seems to me that you begin to understand his legacy if you see that what drove John Bathersby deep, deep down, here I speak again of those great distances, was the desire to see Jesus. Now, I'm going to speak about this at his funeral, but I'll give you a, a little preview here. He loved those words from the letter to the Hebrews, let us not lose sight of Jesus. And he had all those posters made and scattered all around the archdiocese. He had been the spiritual director of the seminary. Now, what is a spiritual director? A spiritual director is someone who is so in touch with God, the real God, and what God is doing in human lives, that he can help other people see what God is doing in their lives. Bathersby was very good at that. Some ways he was, to the day he died last Monday, he was a combination of a, of a very good spiritual director, a man of God, and a bush pastor. Some ways he never ceased being a parish priest of the Toowoomba Diocese. It's a strange combination, but I think you, you, to get John Bathersby right, You've got to look at that combination. So, so that, sent, that passionate search for the real Jesus seems to me to be right at the heart of what John Bathersby was and the legacy that he left um, the Archdiocese, that he leaves, the Archdiocese of Brisbane. He chose as his Episcopal motto the words Lex Crucis in Latin and just translates very simply as the law of the cross. It's a law. In other words, it's just the way life happens. There is no resurrection without the cross. And Bathersby knew the cross in all kinds of ways, seen and unseen. And that's why he became a man of Easter and a real human being for which there's no substitute. Part of that is humility. Part of that is a sense of humour. And he had both big time. But it was all driven by this lifelong and deepening passion to see Jesus and to help others do the same. And for 20 years, that's what he, he pointed to. Not to himself. He wasn't big news in that sense. He wasn't a celebrity. That wasn't the style. Don't look at me, but look at the one who is the key, and that is Jesus. Now, that being said, and I could say much more, but this is not the time or place, although if you wish to ask questions later, by all means. When I look back 
Across the years since 2012, it, it is to me quite astonishing what has happened, not just to me personally, but in a more objective sense. In 2013, two things happened that are strangely convergent and they have determined everything that has happened since in my life and in yours. The first of them was the decision by the federal government to have a royal commission into the institutional responses to sexual abuse. Now, none of us knew at that time the journey that lay ahead that took about five years and is far from over. This royal commission will have a very, very, very long tail. So it's far from over even though the formal sittings are behind us. Now, in the Royal Commission, the failings of the Catholic Church were laid bare in the most dramatic way for everyone to see. I mean, I guess I knew more as a bishop, I knew more of those failings than most because I deal with them from day to day. And it's the most corrosive and demanding part of my job. And I sometimes wonder what it does to me and the other bishops. Perhaps I don't have time or even nerve to seek an answer to that question. You've just got to get on with the job. In all of that, there seemed to me to be a call to the church, not only to face our shocking failings, but to become more deeply and intently what we're supposed to be. Okay, so that was the Royal Commission. And again, there's a great deal more I could say about that because I was myself involved in, in all kinds of ways in that long and agonising process. But the second and strangely convergent thing that happened in 2013 was the election to the, to the papacy of a man most of us had never heard about. I didn't think for a moment he was a chance. I thought he was too old and he was a Jesuit. Now, I was doing some of the media commentary on that conclave and, of course, they always elect popes in the middle of the night here. So my mobile phone went off and I thought, my God, they couldn't possibly have elected a new pope, but they have. So I thought to myself, given how quick the election had been, it must be the Archbishop of Milan, a guy called Angelo Scola, who was much mentioned as a, a, a candidate. So I was boning up on Angela Scola, about whom I knew a fair bit anyway, ready to do all my sparkling interviews. And then, of course, the Cardinal appears on the balcony of St Peter's and says, Bergoglio. I thought, my God, it's the 77-year-old Argentinian Jesuit, about whom I knew next to nothing. So I had to Google him <laughs> and go on with my sparkling interviews. Now, we mightn't have known much about him at that stage, but by heck, we've learned a lot in the meantime from, from the old Argentinian Jesuit. Um, he, he's a, a pope of a kind we've never seen before. He's a pastor, and a bit like John Bathersby, he's recast the papal style. The grand monarchical style's gone. And you see it every time you meet him. And when the Australian bishops met him at our ad limina visit halfway through last year, we sat down with him for two and a half hours. It was incredible how relaxed it was, how fraternal, how open and how unmonarchical. It was unbelievably refreshing. But he's also challenged the church in all sorts of ways to cut through the nonsense and the hypocrisy and to be what the gospel calls us to be. Now, why I say these two events in 2013 are strangely convergent, it seems to me that in both of them, the Holy Spirit, and I've come to take the Holy Spirit much more seriously in more recent years than I used to, the Holy Spirit, through both the Royal Commission and the Pontificate of Pope Francis, is calling the church to become what we're supposed to be and what Jesus wants us to be. The Holy Spirit is the great comforter, we know all that, but the Holy Spirit is also the great disruptor and we've been disrupted 
by these two uh, remarkable events of 2013. My life has, and ministry have been disrupted. I honestly, I look back now on some of my efforts in my early years as a bishop, not so much in Brisbane perhaps, but in my earlier years, and I, I almost cringe at some of the things I said and did, and even some of the ways I understood the role. Because, look, the episcopate is not what it used to be, nor is the papacy, and I don't think that's by accident, and I certainly don't think it's a bad thing. Now, in 2015, something else happened to me that was decisive. Unexpectedly, I was elected to be one of the two Australian bishops to attend the second of those two synods on marriage and the family, you might remember. The first of the two synods was just for the presidents of the conferences. I wasn't the president at that time. So I wasn't at that first one. But I was surprisingly elected to the second. I didn't think I was a candidate because it wasn't sort of my field. Anyway, the lot fell to me and I was quite happy with that. And I did a lot of heavy, heavy preparation for a synod because with these synods of bishops, if you don't prepare beforehand, it all tends to float over you. Preparation is crucial. So I did a lot of preparation. And I went to that synod and it, it, it was an experience of an awakening. I can't think of a better word to describe what it was. I didn't expect it. Uh, it was disruptive, as an awakening always is. But as I've tried to understand what happened to me through that synod in October 2015, that's the word that has come to me again and again and again. Because, you see, the three weeks of that synod were the most powerful and the clearest experience I had ever had of what Pope Francis means when he talks about synodality. Now, it's a slippery word, and a lot of people say to me, oh, what's this synodality bit? And I try and explain. But, but if, the only way you're ever going to really get it into your bones is to experience it working. Now, what I mean is this. The whole field of marriage and the family, as many of you know better than I, is an incredible minefield. Incredible. Halfway through that three-week synod, the whole thing seemed to be going nowhere. It was all over the shop. And I thought, this is going nowhere. And I wasn't the only one at the synod who thought that. It seemed a shambles. But then on October the 17th, a little bit beyond the halfway mark, we had a celebration of the 50 years of the synods of bishops since the Second Vatican Council. Now, these big celebrations in Rome are classics. Well, when I say classics, they're classic talk fests. So speaker after speaker got up and made boring speeches, often in bad Italian, and at the two-hour mark, we were told we could stand up and stretch our legs for the next bit. So having stretched our legs and sat down, we continued more speeches, and the last speech was to be given by Papa Francesco. And at this stage, when he got up to speak, we are all saying, get this, saying, get this over with. Time for lunch, la pasta. So anyway, the Pope starts off with his low voice he can have, but eventually got into his stride and he gave the most remarkable speech about synodality in the church and what it really means. And you, as, he, as he got into his stride, you could feel the atmosphere and the whole change. Everyone began to sit up. They weren't thinking of past anymore. And they were listening with an intensity where you could have heard a pin drop in this big hall. And at the end of the speech, everyone spontaneously stood up and applauded. Now, that's not kosher. But it was, a, it was an amazing experience because somehow it focused the truth of what we were actually experiencing in the synod. Okay, so at the, the end of that, during that speech, I had almost what felt like a flash of inspiration. I said, finally, it is time for the bishops of Australia to make a decision. Since the early 2000s, we'd been talking about some kind of national ecclesial event to make decisions about the future at a time of great change. 
And there was all sorts of umming and ahhing about what it should be and the timing and nothing happened, nothing happened, nothing happened. Committees were set up and nothing happened. And, uh, but it, it came to me with great clarity and power, now is the time. So I went back to Australia and uh, went to the bishops' meeting in November 2015 and I said this to them. I spoke out of this very powerful experience of the Synod in 2015. I said, now's the time for us to move. So they set up another committee and I, of course, was asked to chair it. Make a recommendation. We did. A plenary council. Voila. That's been the biggest decision in the, certainly in the years that I've been Archbishop of Brisbane, nearly eight, but in the years I've been a bishop, no other decision by the Bishops' Conference comes close to it in terms of significance and, I suppose, complexity. So, and what it's about, the plenary count, it's not an event, it's a journey. And we've already begun it and we're all on it, whether you know it or not, or whether you like it or not. We're on the journey already. There are going to be two assemblies, one in Adelaide in October this year, the next in Sydney, June, July next year. It's a bit like those two synods on marriage and the family with a time of fermentation between, allowing the Holy Spirit to stir us up and to surprise us and to lead us into quite new territory that we haven't even dreamt of yet. So... Uh, if you ask me what was the most significant thing in those the years since I last spoke at one of these lunches, it's unquestionably the plenary council. You see, what the Royal Commission and Pope Francis are saying, and it's been made more dramatically clear by events since, not the least of which is the, the fate of George Pell being decided today, um, that... What the change we're being called to in the church is not just superficial. It's not just about structures and strategies, procedures and protocols. They're all important, but they're not enough. You've got to go to some other depth. In other words, first of all, you've got to, you, we have to change the culture. If anything came to me with great clarity during the Royal Commission and my appearances before it and my preparation for those appearances, which was extraordinary... It, it is that we, the whole thing of abuse and its mishandling is a cultural phenomenon. There might be other things you say about it, but you've got to say that if you want to understand why it happened and what actually happened. So shifting culture is the hardest thing of all. If I've learned anything as a bishop, it's that. You know, one of the uh, witnesses before the Royal Commission said, an Irish Jesuit, culture eats strategy for breakfast. You can talk strategy all you like, but if the culture doesn't change, you're just going to go on and on and on and things will never be any different. And, and the horror of abuse is such that that is just uh, intolerable as something to think of even. So we do need to shift the culture and that's really one of the things at stake with this plenary council. If it doesn't shift the culture, then somehow it's failed. Or perhaps we have failed to be open to what the Holy Spirit is doing and saying. At the personal level, and this is a point that Pope Francis make, makes constantly, it's got to become some kind of personal conversion or awakening. I don't know what you want to call it. Choose, take your pick. But it's got to go... And, and in the end, conversion in the Christian sense, and here I return again to the legacy of John Bathersby, the, the conversion is seeing Jesus and hearing him, not as some good old Jesus back... 2,000 years ago, he gave us good example and, you know, we've got to struggle to replicate it now without ever succeeding. I'm talking about Jesus' presence and power here and now, to see him, hear him and follow him. That, that's where the legacy of Bathersby, I think, really does matter because that's, that's the essence of where we are. It's very simple, but it's very deep. Now, <clears throat> that having been said as the, the horizon towards which, which we are being drawn or even pushed at the moment, both in the Archdiocese of Brisbane, in the church around Australia and even around the world. <clears throat> Three things struck me this morning as I pondered my thoughts for, for this moment. Um, a crucial thing for us as we move into the future is leadership. 
What kind of leaders we need? And see, we're not going to have enough ordained leaders for us simply to do what we've always done. I mean, I was out at the seminary on Monday with the other bishops. We had the seminarians in the chapel last night at Mass around the body of John Bathersby. Now, they're all good guys and good things are happening in our seminary, thank God. But there's only 20 of them. So in other words, we're always going to need the ordained leaders of the church in some way, but we're not going to have enough of them to do what we did in the past when we had a plethora of ordained men. So we really need to think of leadership in other terms. Not throwing the ordained out the window, but try and dream of other forms of leadership we've never seen before, particularly women. All right, we say women can't be ordained. Fair fair enough. But if we say that, we are equally obliged to say, well, how can women lead in ways we haven't seen before? I mean, one little thing I've done here in the diocese is I've invited two women to sit in on the Council of Priests and the College of Consultors and one woman to sit in every week at the meeting of what's called the Episcopal Council. And those women have already made their presence felt and their voice heard. Now, as I say, it's, it's a bit timid, but it points in the right direction. We have to draw upon the gifts and the leadership capacities of women in ways we've never done before. But I just put before you the, the, the whole massive area of leadership in the church. We are going to have to reimagine it. Listen to what the Spirit is saying and come up with something that we've never seen before. That's number one. A second thing that strikes me as essential as we look to the future is that we find ways of bringing our immigrant communities to centre stage in the life of the church here. Now, I look around this very large gathering and it's pretty Anglo-Celt. Now, that's not the fact of the church in this part of the world at this time, even less if you go to the other big cities, Sydney and Melbourne particularly. A lot of the real energy, spiritual energy, I mean, in the church at this time is found in our immigrant communities who have been treated as exotic satellites for a very long time. And like some of them like to be exotic satellites. Well, those, those days are over. Uh, They're not exotic exotic satellites. We need them and we need them to lead, not just to sort of be a, 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 you know, a colourful ornament on the body of the church, but really to... So how do we get our our Vietnamese community, our Filipino community, our Hispanic community, our our subcontinental communities, how are we going to draw them into the centre stage? And leadership in the church is a real question. We have one bishop who was born in Vietnam and that surely is pointing the way into the future. How are we going to move to a point where the ACP luncheon will be filled with um, faces that are not pink or white like mine? Okay, so that's another massive challenge, I think, as we look to the future. And the third thing I would mention, and I could mention a thousand, but the third and last thing that I will mention is we have to identify the areas where we might establish a new kind of credibility. The church, and particularly the the leadership of the church, the, the bishops, have lost pretty well all credibility on many issues of public concern. I've seen it time and again, certainly with things like abortion, and euthanasia and same-sex marriage and that we we can rattle away and bang on but almost no one listens now this was not the case not that long ago um so so there's a kind of credibility that is lost forever people talk about restoring credibility or authority we're not going to restore it what we are going to have to do is build something new And I think as part of that process, we, and I mean all of us, because God knows, again, if I've learned anything in these eight years as Archbishop of Brisbane, it is listen to you. Listen to the people. Uh, Don't think for a moment you have all the answers and even know all the questions. 
So, what areas where might we, in might in which we can might they be that in which we can establish some new kind of credibility? I think working with the indigenous in a new way might be one. Working with migrants and refugees may be another. Uh, working for the care of our common home along the lines indicated by Pope Francis in Laudato Si might be another. Uh, certainly working in much more incisive and uh, imaginative ways with the victims of sexual abuse is another way. That, that, that some of the old sort of, dare I call them dead horses, issues that are important but on which we have lost our credibility, our capacity to speak publicly, I think we might just have to set aside for the time being and focus upon areas where we may have a chance of um, establishing some new kind of credibility. So I just mentioned those three things that are on my mind, but there, there, there are so many others and you will have your own uh, insights and suggestions. If I could just conclude by... Uh, letting you know that, that next week there will be the first of a three-part series um, done, being um, done by the ABC for the Four Corners team. It's called Revelation. And it's about abuse in the Catholic Church. Uh, the, the key figure in it all was Sarah Ferguson, who has been the senior correspondent of Four Corners for quite a long time. Now, Sarah Ferguson, when she was planning this whole series, came to me and said she wanted me to be part of it. I was instinctively wary. The ABC haven't been friendly to us in all kinds of ways. But I was actually quite impressed. And Michael Crutcher, who's down the back there, he and I worked together on this and talked a great deal um, and eventually talked with Sarah Ferguson. And in the end, I decided I would be part of the series. And in part because I found Sarah Ferguson actually not only interesting but quite an engaging character. I, didn't, I wasn't troubled by her at all. I quite liked her. And she seemed to me to be open and honest when she said, I don't want to just rake over the embers. I want to do something a bit different that looks to the future. I said, well, if that's what you're on about, I'm happy to be part of it. So they filmed me at Weinberg. They filmed me in Rome at meetings. They filmed me on aeroplane. I mean, I was filmed. It'd probably come down to about three minutes. But... but I'm told that uh, I appear only in the third episode <laughs> and there's some very gruelling stuff on the way to the third episode. Now, the first of the three programs will be shown on St Patrick's Day. Lovely. And so the 17th, the 24th and the 31st uh, are the three nights when the program will be aired. So if you want to see just me, try the 31st. Um, but I, I, I'm a bit apprehensive as, as to how it will turn out, but nonetheless, what, what is done is done. Um, the title Revelation is interesting. I mean, a revelation of what? All oh, right, a revelation of abuse. Well, that's hardly a revelation these days. Nothing much being unveiled. But uh, it seems to me that the real revelation we're in need of is the kind of unveiling that John Bathersby pointed to and... Uh, and sought so deeply in his whole life, and that is the unveiling of the face of Jesus. So showing us how wounded we are, you know, how, how dreadfully scarred and mangled we are, that, there's nothing new in that. What is new is the incredible healing that is in Jesus if we see him and hear him. Now, to finish, can I just offer you uh, some facts and figures that have been produced by Cathy Utrecht, who is our uh, parliamentary relations officer in the diocese and doing a great job. Cathy did a remarkable study, so can we put up the first of these slides, just to finish with, to show you something of the profile of the church in this part of the world. Folks, we are diminished, but we're not going out of business. And if you need any proof of the truth of that claim, just have a look at some of these stats. We're educating 72,492 kids. Uh, 
Kids in Catholic early ed care, 26,701. Supporting people affected by domestic and family violence, 23,000. Aged care disability clients receiving home maintenance and modification support, 13,000. 2.72 million hours of support to disability and aged care clients. This is mostly centre care. Peter, where are you, Peter Selwood? I saw you before. Yeah, they're, they do a fantastic job. Uh, supporting seniors to live well in their home and community, 8.3. Walking alongside Indigenous Australians. This is another one where we've really got to reimagine this one. Indigenous Australians with healing, education, advocacy, much more to do there. Reaching out to, uh, through prison, hospital and seafare ministry, tens of thousands, God knows how many. 4,429 people living with uh, mental illness. That's another hit, uh, smoker. Uh, where we could do perhaps even more than we now do. And if we could look at the second slide, and here I do finish, just have a look at this. Our contribution to Queensland. Now, this is not blowing a trumpet or playing the triumphalist card at all. It's just facts. Um, direct contribution, 943 million, 15,500 jobs, 242 million goods and services purchased locally, 12,000, or let's say 13,000 Queensland businesses benefit, uh, 10,786 additional full-time jobs, 1.1 billion value add, 14,571 volunteers, 45.7 million bucks worth of volunteering. So even economically, and God knows there's more to it than that, it's not the only measure, our total contribution to the Queensland economy, 2.3 billion, not a bad effort. And 20,866 full-time jobs. Now, that's the tip of an iceberg. It's all important for you to see and know and to know that we're kind of everywhere, much of it hidden, but, but we're not going out of business. But business is changing. We cannot, if I'm convinced of anything after eight years as Archbishop of Brisbane, it is that we cannot just put up a sign saying business as usual. But business is a huge service to this state. We're not just about ourselves, we are about the entire community. So, and that's what we have to continue to be at a time when we're under pressure, we might be tempted to retire within and look inwards. This is the kind of engagement we've got to reimagine and do in new and even more powerful ways. Thank you.